This was four days after I found out that my wife was in critical condition fighting for her life. She lost a lot of blood as a part of this process and so we were at home and she started to digress a lot. And I was packing a bag for me to load her up and to, to rush back into the emergency room in the hospital. And as I was doing that, somebody knocked on the door. And when I answered the door, <laughs> it was you. You weren't there empty handed. You had like a basket. You basically forced yourself into my house and said like, hey, I might be able to help. And then you had this bucket of like syrups and supplements and dry foods. And you just literally started like feeding my wife. And I credit you for, in a lot of ways, potentially like saving her life. I don't know how bad things could have gotten if you didn't show up that day. You know, I consider you an angel. After I had my third child, um, I got pregnant right away. Well, that ended in a miscarriage. I had a very scary miscarriage. After that, it was like my body changed and my cycles from then on were heavy, but the bleeding got severe. But what was interesting is people always say, we'll take your uterus out. And I kid you not, I would go to God and it was no. And I'm like, why? Like I'm bleeding to death. It's like, no, you need to learn this and you're gonna help people with this. You know, we go through life and God has this really unique way of sort of orchestrating everything. This is an interview with Ashley Cooney. Ashley is somebody who's near and dear to my heart as she was the woman who stepped up and saved my wife's life. Uh, in a moment where my wife and I were incredibly vulnerable and broken, my wife was in a really difficult medical state and Ashley had the intuition to show up at our home and come in with the knowledge and the skills that she had uh, to save her life. So Ashley means a lot to me personally. We also talked about living with trauma and living with panic, living with fear, and specifically for you know, women who are out there that are living with these fears and these traumas and these struggles, how to fight those, how to combat, how to come back from that. We talked a lot about God in this episode and his hand in being able to guide uh, men and women all over the world to make better decisions to take control of their life. And so I think you'll really enjoy this episode. It was, uh, it was heavy, it was personal. And welcome to the Roller Coaster Podcast. Strap in. Ashley Cooney, welcome to the Roller Coaster hey, Podcast. Hey, thanks for ha thanks for having me. This is awesome. <laughs> I appreciate you uh, you taking the time. This is going to be it's going to be a unique episode. Yeah, I'm um, excited for a lot of reasons. But for the audience at home, I've actually shared multiple times a story that happened in my life that involves you, and so I never actually really contemplated bringing you on the show. But I think. I think it makes a lot of sense. And so I'm going to actually start out this episode a little bit differently, Okay. which is I'm going to start out with me sharing a story, okay, that uh, you are the main character of. And I think it'll be fun to- I think there's a lot of main characters in this few. story. <laughs> there's a few. So March 5th, 2022, uh, this was four days after I found out that my wife was um, in critical condition fighting for her life. Uh, let me paint the vision. We're at our home in Gilbert, our rental home. We're actually in the process, ironically, of building a home that we were building with you guys. And my wife started to, she lost a lot of blood as a part of this process. And so we were at home and she started to digress a lot, mm -hmm. right? And when I say digress, what that means is um, starting to turn incredibly white, mm -hmm. like pale and then white. Uh, becoming very weak, uh, having a hard time sitting up, having a hard time even communicating. And uh, and it was really scary. And so I was gathering our things, um, not knowing what to do. I called her mom. I told her that we're going to go back to the hospital. And I was packing a bag for me to load her up and to to rush back into the emergency room in the hospital. And as I was doing that, somebody knocked on the door. And I thought, this is incredibly inconvenient timing. 
And because several people, you know, had come over yeah. that day to check on us and bring food and treats and all kinds of things. And when I answered the door, um, it was you. And I thought, my, my first thought was like, what are you doing here? Like, this is, this is not good timing. And I think I even told you, I think I said, Hey, I appreciate you coming by, but it's like, I've, we got to go to the hospital. And I think what I recall of this experience was, you know, you weren't there empty handed. You had a, you had like a basket or a bucket of stuff. And you basically said, you basically forced yourself into my house <laughs> and said like, hey. Sounds like me. <laughs> I, I might be able to help, right? Yeah. I had no idea, like, I had no idea why you thought you'd be able to help. Um, you said, you said, listen, I've, I've, uh, I've dealt with some severe blood loss mm -hmm. and there's some remedies that I can, I think I can be helpful with. So you came into our house. Um, I think the first thing Brooklyn told you was like, Hey, Ashley, I appreciate you coming by, but like, I, I I'm not doing well. Like I got to go to the hospital Yeah, and you just, um, you just were able to, uh, talk to her and calm her down. And then you had this bucket of like syrups and supplements and <laughs> dry foods and whole foods and like fruits and all kinds of crap. And you and you just literally started like feeding my wife stuff. And I'm like, I don't know what Ashley knows or what's going on, but Brooklyn seems to be calm and in a better state. And every time she said, I need to go to the hospital, you just kept saying, Hey, just trust me. Just trust me. And so, you know, when I tell this story, it's, it's, it's emotional. It's hard to tell because I really feel like, um, you know, there's not a lot of people in, in your life that you run into and <laughs> You're almost, you're almost convinced like they're only on this earth for one thing and it's to, you know, I'm convinced that like you're here to do what you did with my wife and I credit you for in a lot of ways, potentially like saving her life. Right. So I don't know how bad things could have gotten if you didn't show up that day. Um, obviously when you go to the hospital, it's different, right? They just it's not a good environment to be in for people. They're loading you up with IVs, which is typically a lot of junk, mm -hmm. you know, some good stuff, some bad stuff. Um, but the fact that you were able to come with just natural good remedies and do what you did, um, you know, I consider you an angel. Oh, well, I appreciate that. So, you know, and I think I, I've also told this part of the story before and, and then I'll put a bow on it and I'd love to have your sort of your perspective on this story, your side of the story. But, you know, we go through life and God has this really unique way of sort of orchestrating everything. And there were so many reasons why we shouldn't have ever lived where we lived. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't have lived in your ward. Shouldn't have even known you. One of my best friends was a builder at Starwood yeah. Custom Home. Like we shouldn't have had this relationship yeah. It didn't make sense for, for it to come together the way that it did. And it did. And you showed up in just the right time. And, uh, you know, you changed our lives. So thank you. Well, I'm glad I did. Because Brooklyn, as you know, is an angel. And she needed to be here for you and your kids. And, and I've seen a tremendous change in you because of this experience. And you're yeah. now blessing people's lives because of it. So I, I'm grateful that I was part of that journey. It's really yeah. cool. What was going on? Like... Do you recall what you were doing that day at all? Like, does that, does that day have any meaning to you? Like, why did you have this prompting to come to our home when you did? So I want to say thank you to our newest sponsor, Jovi Health. I, first of all, love the founder. She was on the podcast. She's a friend of the show, Kim Olson. And this product is actually incredible for a lot of reasons. So when she came in on the podcast, she gave me one of their kits. Okay. And these are basically these little strips that are like infused with some type of compound 
that can alleviate pain in men and women, right? So for women, it's predominantly used in menstrual cycles. But for me, I had lower back pain. And so she said, hey, put this on your back, wear it around for a few days and see how you feel. And it's actually legit. Like it works incredibly well. And so I've been super happy with the results. I've asked Kim to actually get me like bigger slabs of this stuff um, because it's helped alleviate, you know, some lasting back pain that I've had for years. And so go check out Jovi Health. We'll have a code uh, down below in the description. And you're not going to be disappointed by doing that. I'm glad that you brought God up because that was one of those things I actually didn't ask you before, but I wanted to make sure it was okay to, to even bring that up because yeah. I feel like that is first and foremost, the most important aspect of the way I live my life is by putting God central to everything. And one of the things that I have really learned through my own trials is how to tune in and how to really use my gifts of intuition and to really follow those. And sometimes it comes at taking what you and I would perceive as a risk, yeah. as being pushy or being bold. And it's hard. It's not easy. And I remember the night before I had gotten a phone call from um, someone in, in, our, in our church and she had explained what was going on, not knowing the connection. She didn't know that, that at the time we were um, in the process of working on house plans and a build with you guys. And she didn't know that I already knew Brooklyn to the extent that I had known her. So Brooklyn and I had already had a relationship yeah. because of that. And um, so she happened to mention what was going on. And, and of course, I went to bed that night with you and, and Brooklyn in my prayers. And and I knew uh, not long I was I was in bed and... As I was pondering on you, because I, I spent a lot of hours in bed at night pondering about people and how I can help and what I need to do for my own life. And and the thought came, hey, you know stuff. You've got to use your knowledge. And uh, through my own experience, I, I had learned so much that I knew during my experience that it was going to be used to help people. And to this day, I continue to help people where I can when when yeah. people – it's it's – Bleeding issues are common um, in, in a variety of forms. And so um, I remember that morning I got up and it was almost like just this, this energy of, hey, I know what to do and I know what to grab. And I just grabbed a basket and I just started filling it up. And I have um, a butler's pantry at home and I have, it is filled with herbs and supplements and and all kinds of things from just my um, my past experiences through health issues, not just my own, but my children. It seems like um, anything strange that our fa that anybody could get, our family seemed to had had over the years. Yeah. And so I had learned, and I had trained, and I had I had made it a, a part of my purpose in life was to learn these things. And so I gathered everything up, and I remember just thinking, "Gosh, like might as well." Um, of course, I didn't know what your situation was going into it, yeah. um, but I do know this: when when you do have bleeding issues, your fears are to an extreme. They're yeah. they're um, they're like honestly, it's like living in trauma and panic to a degree that nobody really can understand. Yeah. Um, unless you were in, you know, I mean, you could liken it into like the fear of being in a car accident. And having your legs pinned and you don't know, well, what's underneath there? What's happening? What's going on? I can't see. Am I paralyzed? Am I dying? Or am I just, you know, am I just in shock and I just can't feel my legs? Yeah. And and so that's what was so scary about this uh, is about bleeding is, and I understand this, is that there's a lot of emotional trauma that comes with that. So when I walked into your home, I I knew and I could feel and sense there's trauma here. There is an emotional trauma and it's going to make her feel worse and it's going to make the situation worse. And I do remember walking in and seeing Brooklyn and she was white and she was weak. Um, she, it was almost like seeing a reflection of myself from yeah. the years past. Um, and I was uh, moved to be able to share that experience and say, hey, I know where you're at. I know what you're feeling and I know what we need to do. And it is taking a risk because I could, I you know, by, by mentioning these things, if you didn't go to the hospital, what if something was going on? Yeah. But I remember feeling the sense of peace of just, no, she's okay. You need to just educate her. She needs that education. And I remember you did watch me, but what was amazing was that you literally 
I think maybe from what you shared with me, maybe just that little, that little glimmer of hope that you saw in Brooklyn, it like lit a fire under you. And suddenly, suddenly you're like, okay, what do we do? I remember you had typed up because all the supplements were in the basket and we yeah. kind of talked about it and you had typed up a schedule for her. And then you were the one that nursed her. I think I ended up leaving for, for Hawaii yeah. like a day or two later. Yeah, I was stressing. And you were stressing. <laughs> and, and I remember just feeling so much peace because you had you had outlined it, you had had it typed up and and I sat with what you had sent me and I could feel just that, again, that piece of yeah. he's got this, yeah. she's going to be okay. And I remember coming back from that trip and when I came to visit, it was a totally different Brooklyn. Yeah. She had color back in her cheeks and she looked phenomenal. You could tell she was healing. So um, I would say for me, it was just living in, in a, a place of faith and just moving forward with what my my gut, my intuition, what God was was confirming to me was this this is okay. This is gonna be okay. But she needs some help and you you have it. Yeah. So how do you you know, I wanna I wanna drill on that a little bit here. Like how, how do you live a life in a way <sighs> where God <clears throat> trusts you with these sort of things. You know, that's a really good question. It's a great, it's, it's, it, it's a good question. Um, I, first of all, I, I think it comes from a place of love, my, my own love for, for God. Um, and that doesn't come without your own trials and with your own, um, understanding that that's the only way. Um, it, it takes a lot of practice, um, a ton of practice, and, and it's taken a lot of hours to, of reflection and of learning what works for you. So the way that I connect with God uh, may look a little different from the way you connect with God. So it kind of, it's again, kind of like figuring out the dose. What yeah. does that dose look like? Just yeah. like we knew what we needed to dose Brooklyn with. What does my dose look like to be able to, to be with God and to, to feel him and, and, and honestly, it's also um, one of the things I've learned by uh, learning to trust my intuition, which I really trust. It's yeah. strong. And I think in a, in a way, it's a little triggering to people and a little frustrating to people because sometimes I'll do things and, and it probably confuses people. Like, well, who is this person? And it's like, well, this is what my, my intuition is telling me. This is what I'm feeling. And it's never let me down. It's always been correct for me. Um, but I do believe that... Um, to have a relationship with God, it requires dedication, time. It requires reflection. It requires sacrifice. It requires um, uh, giving to others. I think it's aligning your your thoughts um, in higher vibrational thoughts. So in a lot of gratitude, in a lot of uh, joy, a lot of forgiveness. So working on forgiveness is is instrumental, especially, I feel like that's the one thing that God keeps testing me on is how is forgiving people. Yeah. And, and it's hard. It's a lot of work, but what's interesting, um, like I said, I lay at night, I, I'll get in bed after I've prayed and I literally will talk to God and I'll ask questions. God, can I know something about my children? And you'll feel that instantly. Okay. Which child do I need to know about? And I'll know which child. And, and it's like the thoughts come as I talk to him, the answers come. Yeah. And it's just learning to hone in on those. And sometimes you'll ask a question and there's nothing. And you're like, okay, obviously I don't need to know that. Yeah. I, and so it's it's been cool. It's been a really neat journey for me to learn how to communicate with God and, and learning to, to teach that to my children, trying to teach them. I've got my oldest child who right now we're working a lot on how do you, how do you hear, how do you listen, how do you talk to God and, and trying to develop that within her because my goal is – to have my child leave my home equipped to face this world. Yeah. I think there's so many people who, you know, claim to or aspire to have a good relationship with God. One like you're talking about where when you speak, he listens, he answers, you yeah. listen back, you answer right. And so it's like you've built that trust with him over mm -hmm. time oh, it's been to where work. now he knows like mm -hmm. that you're, you're so in tune with the way that he communicates with you that he can give you things different than maybe he can give others, right? Yeah. And you know what? I remember listening to a talk um, uh, when I was going through my own uh, trials with blood issues. And and in the talk, um, it was a leader of our church. And 
he had, was speaking to uh, the youth at a college and he said, you can get inspiration daily. You can get answers from God daily. And yeah. it was like that light bulb moment of, oh, I can? Wait a second. If, I, if, if he's saying I can do that and he's telling an audience of youth this, yeah. then of course I can do this. And, and I remember that was one of those moments, those life-changing moments of life where I literally heard what he said. And I'm like, I, I'm going to do that. I'm going to learn that. Yeah. And it's been awesome. And it's been awesome not only to learn that, but then to learn how to go talk to my husband about this and to see him do it as well and yeah. to see him shift. And then, and I, I really truly believe, you know, any marriage, it's, it's between you, your husband and God. And now to have that connection where he and I have learned that and we do that, we walk nightly. And we, we literally will, will talk about the things and I'll ask some questions. I'll be like, hey, this is a thought that comes to my mind. Um, and these are some thoughts. What are you thinking? And we've learned to communicate together, including God in that yeah, and sitting really cool. with those answers together. So yeah. that's been really cool. Yeah. There's also like, you know, when you have that intuition and you listen to it mm -hmm. and you act on it and you repeatedly do that for a long period mm -hmm. of time, then, you know, now it's like God knows that you're going to do it. He expects that you're going to yes. do it. And so he gives it to you more frequently, mm -hmm. right? So it's like mm -hmm. literally on a daily basis. And I'm, yeah. I'm getting to a place now with men because he knows that my main focus is trying to help men mm -hmm. find hope, right? In this very right. challenging and depressed world. And so I'm getting this on the daily basis where a thought will come to my mind that I need to reach yeah. out to somebody. I need to call somebody or random awesome. people that I'm, that I'm meeting in the public um, where I'm feeling these feelings and when I act on them mm -hmm. and they were right, the person's like, I did need to hear from you today. I did need some inspiration. Okay. He just keeps pouring those back mm -hmm. into my life. Right. So it's this, mm -hmm. it's this ongoing cycle. Does, awesome. does that ever feel like, you know, I think about this a lot and people ask me this, like, does that feel heavy? I'd and love to hear your answer. First. I think <laughs> it's, I mean, to me, it's like, yes, but it is yeah. what it is. Yeah. Now. Like, I've told him this is my desire. Yeah. He is now flowing through me to help change people's lives. Yeah. So now it's just part of my calling. So it is what it is. Yeah. And I also think like from my experience and from my husband's experience, um, uh, it's it's been interesting because I think that you know your heart and and we know our heart. And and there's been a lot of difficulties that we faced and challenges with people over the years. Yeah. And or even um, and you kind of feel a little bit like because you're trying so hard to do what the Lord wants, you almost feel like a little bit of a an attack. I don't know if you've experienced this, but that's been what's been difficult for us going, gosh, I feel like we're trying so hard to always do the right thing. And there's a little pushback. But I think that that maybe you haven't experienced that yet. Yeah. But I think what's really cool about that is that's challenging you. And I think God allows it to to, to really let you see, hey, I'm, I'm still in the boat with you, God. Yeah. And, and I think that that's been cool is for my husband and I to say, okay, we've been hurt so now let's heal with god and we're going to stay in the boat yeah and we're not going to we're not going to give up on god because this is part of what we signed up for this is part of mor mortality and this is this is something that we can be blessed with and these are for our good and this creates wisdom and growth yeah so it's been cool you've got a crazy story i think about your physical health and specifically you know your now unique qualification to be able to help people with blood retention and just blood work in general. Right. Tell, tell, tell me your story. So, um, I suffered, I, I had fertility issues. Um, my, my third child, um, we always tease, you might be the doctor's baby, but really she is Justin. She's, she's, <laughs> 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 but <laughs> she just looked different than everybody. No, <laughs> No, but we tease her. She knows we're kidding. Yeah. Um, but we say that just because, you know, she she was created a little differently, which is really cool. And that that experience, again, was a trial, but gave me a lot of sympathy and empathy and a lot of compassion for women who go through through fertility issues. But after I had her, um, I got pregnant right away. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like, how how could I not get pregnant with her? And suddenly my body's turned back on again. This is amazing. Well, that ended in a miscarriage. I had a very scary miscarriage. And so, um, and that that's, you know, totally different story in and of itself. But um, after that, it was like my body changed. Something changed. And my cycles from then on were heavy. And they, they um, 
just got worse and worse with the years. So let's see, my, my youngest is 12 years old. And so this has been going on. So this whole thing started about 12 years ago. And so I started with these cycles and they just got progressively worse. And, um, now there was a lot of other things going on in my life at the same time. I think that, that, uh, mental and emotional things do, uh, have the propensity of, exaggerating our health issues. It, it, it compounds with whatever you've got going on. And so I was dealing with things that I wasn't unaware of, which led me on this journey of, of not just physical health, but mental and emotional health. But the bleeding got severe. And it got so severe that I, at one point, had two girls working for me, employed, coming into my home and helping to raise my children. And um, they did everything. They did the shopping. They helped with cooking, cleaning, laundry, uh, taking my kids out. And I didn't realize it at the time, but the bleeding was not only causing a tremendous amount of emotional damage and stress, which can deplete you. It depletes your, your minerals, your vitamins, your nutrients, everything which you need to have energy. But it was also... Um, um, It was depleting all of that, but it was depleting my blood and I was down to nothing. And what was funny is I, I um, met an herbalist and started working with her and she started to teach me how to nourish my body. And she started teaching me how to, again, I was on this journey with God and learning how to listen to him and trust him, but she was teaching me how to use that to even figure out what supplements and nutrients I needed for my body. So I literally would put things out on the counter and start practicing with the Lord, Lord, what do I need? Mm. What needs to go in my body? Wow. What needs to be in my body at what time each day? How do I do this? Because I don't know how to do this. I had been to doctors. I had gone all over the place. And it wasn't until I saw a naturopath years later that she actually did a blood test and she was able to see you actually are showing signs of hemorrhaging. I remember we even went into the ER one night because I thought, my goodness, I need a blood transfusion. And because I was taking supplements that was building my blood, he took the labs and he's like, you're fine. Your blood is showing fine. So at that point, I was like, well, then what's going on? If my blood is not so bad that you're taking me into the hospital, then what's happening? Mm -hmm. And as you know, with Brooklyn, she was sent home and they were probably telling you she's fine. Like her levels are where they need to be, but they were still too low. Yeah. And so um, I started learning how to, to do that. And I started learning how to nourish my body and take on, in all the right things. And then of course I realized, Hey, the bleeding, we've got to stop this. And so that was a whole new journey of just figuring that out. But what was interesting is people always would always say, we'll take your uterus out, go get your uterus out. Why aren't you taking your uterus out? <laughs> and I kid you not, I would go to God and it was no. And I'm like, why? Like I'm bleeding to death. And it's like, no, you need to learn this. And you're going to help people with this. Yeah. And, and it was interesting. I remember there was a few times in particular, I could remember exactly where I was um, in what house, because obviously this had been going on for several years and we moved from house to house to house to get to the house where we're in today. And I remember specific times and places where I would turn to my husband and I'd be on the couch. And I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. We're getting this uterus out. He'd be like, okay. And he'd, he'd honor that, support it. And then not t within, gosh, 24 hours. Um, each time it would be within a 24 hour frame, he'd come back, he'd say, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right. And so I learned how to manage it. And now today I'm thriving. Um, we figured out what it is. Now we're adjusting some, some things. Little did I know it was low testosterone and low progesterone. Mm. And once I started taking those, it literally changed my cycles and, but then what's happened now is just trying to find that balance. Now it's just too much for my body and I'm doing it more naturally. So yeah. it's just trying to find that right balance to get it to, to, to not only just keep the bleeding down, but to then also keep my mental and emotional state and my physical body where it needs yeah. to be. Yeah. So it's been cool. It's been a neat journey. You talked a lot about, uh, you know, earlier you gave the example of living in trauma and panic were the two words that yeah. you used, right? So, you know, obviously you just condensed 10 years of mm -hmm. living in trauma and panic into Every month. a few minutes, right? So mm -hmm. what were some of those moments where you just felt like this extreme panic, right? And the, the reason I'm asking this is because I think there's a lot of people out there right now mm -hmm. listening who are living with severe trauma, who are mm -hmm. living with 
like panic. They're living with pain. They're depressed. They have fear. Right. You know, how did you, or how do you continue to just work through that when things get tough? So I was, I came an anxious person. That's always been my personality. Um, I've always come with a fast thinking brain and mind. Um, and I will say that having this bleeding issue and this problem for years, um, honestly, the only way to get through it really was two things. One, I married an incredible person. I married, I married a rock. I married somebody who um, honors me, loves me, supports me. Anything I've ever wanted to do, he's, he's my number one supporter. Uh, number two, I, like we talked about, I learned to trust God and trust his voice and trust those, the, just that inspiration, those promptings. And you know what? I, like I've studied all kinds of different um, things. I've, I've studied all kinds of um, modalities. And I've also, you know, I'm a religious spiritual person. And so I learned the things that I needed to do to, to calm myself, to hear that voice. Because I, like I... I hate telling people, well, you're in fear. That's not, that's not having faith. That's not true. Yeah. You can still be a very faithful person and have fear. Like look at the world we're living in. Look at, look at some of the the challenges people are facing. Um, but for me, it's creating that practice of, of finding stillness and learning to calm that brain down and learning to tune in. And so that is the challenge that anybody in fear or in any kind of suffering right now has to do is you've got to figure out what does that look like? Do you need to take up yoga and start practicing yoga? Do you need to find somebody who can help you process emotions? Do you need to find somebody who can do cranial sacral therapy? I actually went and took all the courses. So as I'm dealing with my bleeding issues, I was doing cranial sacral therapy courses on the side. And so I learned how to do that, and I and I started getting that work done. Um, I learned to start setting boundaries with people. Um, in Chinese medicine, the uterus, um, adrenals, all of the, the different things that can control some of this bleeding stuff, liver, so having a toxic liver can actually cause an increase in bleeding as well. And guess what? My naturopath validated it. She's like, you're high in estrogen. Of course, your body's dumping blood. It's trying to get rid of all the estrogen because it doesn't have the testosterone and the, the um, estrogen to balance that. Mm. And so um, it's learning how to find your answers through those moments of peace. But I had to learn detoxification processes because I noticed that made it different. Um, but the other thing too, there's emotions and things like I was saying, um, like my liver, like it's it's stagnated with anger and frustration from from past experiences and childhood experiences and family experiences. So I had to process all that emotion. I had to learn boundaries. I had to learn to be okay with boundaries and it triggering people. And so it, it's really cool because um, I love the scripture about the woman with the bleeding. And and I remember picking up a book and reading her story from the perspective of somebody else. And in the scriptures, I don't know how it's phrased, but basically she touched the hem of Jesus's uh, robe. And and when she did, she was healed. And when he turned around and he addressed her, he said, woman, you did this. You did this. And um, even though it was because she touched him, it was her faith that made him whole. And my and I remember reading in it, it, it the, the person and the author, I don't even know the book, he said she had done her work prior to coming to Christ. And so I think that was instrumental in me going, we have to do our work. Mm. Anxiety and fear is just masking the work that's below that. It's masking what needs to be healed and you got to get to work. And what's really cool about it is as you do that work, you start to become you. You start to become a more whole, happier, confident person and you can walk through life going, okay, that's okay. People don't like me. That's okay if I'm not seen the way that I'm meant to be seen. And, and trust me, there are times that I fall back on that and I go back into that pattern. I go, wait a second. I learned this. I need <laughs> to stop that. What yeah. did I do? What, what are my tools? So you gather a tool bag and that's what you have to do in order to get through anxiety and fear and through your health issues and those crises. Yeah, really well said. I'm assuming that some of this experience had an effect on your family. Like, how did this affect your kids and your relationship yeah. with your husband? It's so interesting. Um, <clears throat> oh, I think it brought my husband and I so much closer together. Um, I, 
I remember he was running a business. Um, I you could see the 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 terror, the fear, but he was my rock. He was always good. He held space for me. Um, it's a term that you learn in in some healing modalities. But he was so good at holding space for me. Describe that in detail, by the way. <sighs> What does that look so like? So if I had a hard time and I needed to cry, my husband would just let me cry. He would just hold me and let me cry. And I think for a man, that's being extremely vulnerable, letting a woman just cry. Um, my husband, um, if I needed something, he was there. If I needed him just to be my still place, he was there. Um, he became my protector. He started to, and he had been saying things for years because, um, you know, I have this idea of like, well, everybody, you know, everybody's beautiful and wonderful and has the best intentions. And and my husband started to stand up for me. Hey, hon, like you're being mistreated. Hey, honey, yeah. you, this is not good for your health. Um, he was really good about saying, hey, you're going too fast. You need to slow down. Uh, one of the things I loved was I had the habit. It was a pattern that I had learned from from just seeing it of being frustrated when I didn't have somebody helping me cook or clean or run the errands. And because my husband is a very good at pacing himself, that's his gift. He's always learned how to pace himself and he's very steady. And I remember that I would do things like, you know, ah, like those kind of things. And, and my husband, it was really cool. He taught me how to express myself yeah. and he said, Hey, 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 I need you to use your words. Tell me what's going on. And I feel like that's being somebody who holds space for another person is use your words. Tell me what's going on. And I can tell you what I'm what I'm feeling, and we can work this out. Yeah. And so, and it could be anything yeah. at any time, right? Yeah, and and it's really a good trait that any one of us should know. And it's, it's what I think he taught me, and I've taught my kids is, hey, use your words. You're mad, you're frustrated, you're angry, but you got to use your words. What's going on? Yeah. So, yeah, he's he's been incredible. How did this shape your perspective on life? I, I think you used the words earlier that this reshaped a lot, maybe everything. Right. So like, right. how did, how did going through this <laughs> experience specifically change your perspective, the way you prioritize your time? Okay. Um, my family is my everything. Um, so, uh, you did ask me how to impact my children. Um, I've asked my children and they're like, mom, like, I don't really remember it, which yeah. is so interesting because I'm like, yeah, your subconscious mind's got to be holding on. Yeah. Like, we got to do some work here. I'll unpack that at some point. Yeah, but what's really cool is I love being present with my children. I love it. I am always, and even when, so remember when I had these girls, I'd be down for two weeks and then up for two weeks. And so for the two weeks I was up, I was playing with them. I was cooking with them. I was dancing with them. I'm singing with them. I'm getting in the car with them. And my kids are really cool because they know when I'm in my head. And my kids are like, hey, mom, you're in your head. And so they got to learn how to express that. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Or yeah, I am. I'm trying to figure something out. Um, but uh, it's been really cool because I think the way that this has all changed my perspective is just in, in really learning, A, that family is first and foremost. Yeah. You have to give your time, your energies. And I sacrifice girls' night outs. Um, a lot of things that a lot of other women and, and people do. I'm like, no, my family is my priority yeah. and they are my best friends and they are my people. And so I really hone in on my family and my marriage. So I spend a lot of time with my husband. We date each other daily, <laughs> like literally. We always find an hour to two to three hours together every day. Awesome. And so that perspective changed. Um, the other thing that it did for me was it made me realize life is too short and life is too complicated to let complicated people in my life that can hurt and make it worse. Now, does mm. this mean I'm perfect? Mm. No, because people are people can come in and they can look like a complete package. And so that's one of the skills that I'm trying to, to work with God on right now is how do I discern between healthy and not healthy? And I'm getting so much better. I'm so proud of myself. And even my husband's seen that. But it, it, it's just one of those things like, hey, I don't... I don't have time for the drama. I don't have time for the pain and suffering. And and God, really, what's really cool is I've been given probably a whole array of personalities to discover that with. Yeah. And it's probably because I, and that's the other thing I've learned that when you ask for something, you get the experiences. And I've gotten those experiences. And now what's cool is we've been really working on self-protection and what that looks like. How much time and energy do you give to a person? When can you say no? Yeah. Because I think in the past, I went to the extreme of always doing, giving, being totally nice because I didn't want to be a mean person and yeah. I'm realizing that has a balance as well. Yeah. 
So you, you said complicated person. I, I actually appreciate that word mm -hmm. to describe, you know, some of these people that can be energy vampires or, right. you know, they're unhealed. Not, not they're great unhealed people, people, right? Yeah. A, a, a lot of it is just the fact that they're dealing with their own version of something yeah. really bad and they're yeah. not healed from it yet, right? And so how do you balance like giving those kind of people grace and wanting to sort of be their savior or their light in their life mm -hmm. versus cutting them off? So what I've realized is you're never truly a light to them. You mm. really aren't. Um, you're a means to an end. Or you're satisfying something within them that needs to be healed. Mm. And I've started, as I've done this work, I've started to realize I can't do that for them. Yeah. And and I realized that because I did my own work. Yeah. And where and it's sad because some people you kind of have to say, hey, until we talk this out, like there has to and, and, and it triggers people. Yeah. You know, if you're like, hey, like this dynamic's not working for me anymore. Um, and you know. And I don't think I've, I've been perfect. I think that that's been part of my process too is like, how do you convey that message to somebody without triggering them? Yeah. Like, hey, we've got a problem. I'd like to work this out. Um, some people just don't want to and that's okay. Um, but I think the way that I give them grace is, and I realize this, I, I've loved, there's a lot of people out there that talk about this now, about how you can love people from a distance. You can love people and see so much good in them but just know that there's create some separation. There's there's yeah. the part of them that's difficult and too painful, yeah, and is not honoring your needs or supporting you or even seeing you the way that you know your heart aligns, truly aligns, yeah, uh, with with uh, God and with others, and you just kind of have to go. Okay, well, I gotta go. I gotta go do my work. Mm -hmm. and, and and Justin and I have noticed with our children, and with our marriage, and with our business, and what we've got going on, we're so busy that we have to give ourselves some grace yeah. and go, hey, I, we just, that's okay if they don't want to heal it. We don't want to make it complicated, but we just want to understand some boundaries. That can't happen. We got to move on. Um, I would say there's definitely people I would love to fix some things with, but as my husband and I talk about it, we're like, you know what? We've said enough. We've tried enough. And it's up to them now. Yeah. yeah they've got to go do the work yeah. for sure. That's always a hard one, right? Because yeah. there are people in my life right now who I see so much potential in. For sure. And some of them are probably listening going, he's talking about me. And I've had to just create distance yeah. because it ca I, I cannot fix everything. Like at yeah. some point, I can only give what I can give yeah. and then the rest is up to them and God yeah. and like working yeah. through their own shit, right? For sure. So that's 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 the thing that I always have a hard time with is like, when is the right time to start to create some of that separation with people? So my answer to that would be you've got to trust your intuition and God. Yeah. And that's been the hardest part because there have been times where I'm like, well, hey, what if I – and I've gone to God. Well, what if I try this? Or what if I – you know, and you sit there and you reflect on it and you ponder on it and you journal about it. And you're like, well, what if I try this avenue or this? Yeah. And the thought is be still. Just yeah. be still. Let them do their healing. Let them do their work. And, and they get their choice. They get that, they get to choose whether they do it or not. And, and it's unfortunate because, uh, sometimes vulnerability, well, we all, we know vulnerability can be very scary and very hard, yeah. but accountability is even harder. Yeah. And that's really where true healing comes is when you go, okay, I'm accountable. I've done wrong. Yeah. I, or I'm, I'm a mess or, Hey God, show me how to get out of this. And when you take accountability and, and that is one of those things I think my husband has given me grace for. And, and again, go back to holding space. Yeah. He's allowed me to make mistakes and he has been okay with that because he's happy with the progress he's seen. Yeah. And likewise, the same, you know, with him, I've seen so much growth and so much healing within him. So it's okay to let go of that past and, and forgive and, and to, and to let go of, of what that person was before yeah. because they did their work and took that accountability. Yeah. Thank you to our sponsors over at Bucked Up. I love this company. I love their products, their apparel, and their supplements. Recently, they dropped the mother of all pre-workouts, Mother Bucker. This is not for the faint of heart. This will make you want to claw your face off. So don't get stuck in traffic when you're headed to the gym. I love these guys. I love this company, and I love their products. They are clearly the best tasting pre-workout on the entire market, and they're number one for a reason. Bucked Up is my favorite workout brand, hands down. 
And they also have my favorite apparel for working out and just for daily life. It's Lululemon like quality, but for a fraction of the price that's affordable. So head over to their site, buckedup.com, where you can check it out. And for 20% off their entire site, use the code TylerHall20. So I'm building a brand right now called Levels. Mm-hmm. And Levels is really, you know, the undertones of what it is 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 helping men fight you know, these mental health battles that we all deal with on a daily basis. Right. And so, so the way that I think about, and and by the way, it's a very biased towards men program. Mm -hmm. Like we don't support women. Can we do one for girls? (laughs) Yeah. And, and a lot of, and a lot of women are like, what the heck, man? (laughs) Like we're here too. Right. And it's like, so for sure, inevitably I will partner with a woman that's capable of building that side of the, the brand when the timing is right. Right. So what I see with men today is a lot of them have found an incredible lack of purpose mm. and fulfillment mm. in their life, which comes from a variety of different things. But a lot of it has to do with not having other men, okay, mm-hmm. not their wife, not their mm-hmm. person, other men that will hold space for them, right. that will be available for them when they're at their lowest point, right. that they can actually pick up the call and say, hey, dude, yeah. I'm struggling today. I just need somebody to listen to me, yeah. right? And so we're trying to foster a community where that becomes more acceptable. And and men just struggle talking. They struggle mm-hmm. talking about these things, whether it's in an intimate setting For or sure. whether it's broadcasted to the whole world. Yeah. We struggle with that because society has told us that that's not okay. Like you need to be the For rock. Sure. You need yeah. to be the man. Be you man. can't be like, like yeah. you've got to be masculine all the time. But I think there's a there's a feminine energy that is a, is appropriate and important for men to tap into. Totally that they have a hard time with, right? So that, that's mm-hmm. what the brand is about, okay? So if you were to do this for women, mm-hmm. like what are the things that you're seeing are happening in the world with women? And mm-hmm. where do they need help? Okay. And like maybe take that that angle for me. Well, A, I think we could all agree that the social media, it's a blessing and a curse. Like, you know, like it's, and it's an amazing tool and skill, but man, it's meeting, it's, it's eating women. It's killing their worth. Um, so I think there's that, um, I think the number one thought that even comes to my own mind when I start to feel a little down about myself is, oof, you're in the belief that you are not enough. And I think that there are women, we all have different skills and traits and abilities. We, we came different. Um, some people can, can. They have the gifts of, you know, being an entrepreneur. Some are better mothers than others. And and I think meaning like they really give 100% of their attention to their children. And I think we th- that comparison is really deadly. And until you find you and like you, you're yeah. in trouble. Yeah. And I also think um, that men and women, that disconnect, which is really cool that you're teaching men to open up and find other men to do that with because those skills are only going to come back to bless the lives of their wives. I think there's a lot of men that are not in tune or in touch to their wives. But I also think that there's a lot of women who in their own insecurities, their own frustrations, their own emotional uh, discords, they're triggering and lashing out at their husband in the wrong way. And and I think that that's causing a lot of, I mean, I think every man, no man goes, oh, hey, I want to cheat on my wife. Like that's my goal. Every man, when you marry that woman, you want to be in love with that woman, right? Yeah. yeah. And so I think that the challenge that women have, and, and a lot of women, I'm very blessed. I feel very loved. And I love my husband. It's, it's ridiculous. My, it's like my little, my little husband always says, she's like, I'm obsessed with you. And, and she is with me. <laughs> and it's kind of weird. But the funny thing is, is she's seen how obsessed I'm with her dad. Yeah. She knows I'm just obsessed with him. And um, I have cute aggression. I cute aggress the, the heck out of that guy. And it drives my kids <laughs> crazy. They're like, stop touching him. And I'm like, but I love him so much. And he's so great. But I think that for women, it's um, – there's a few things. It's stop comparing, start creating what you want to create, start learning how to love your man, start asking for your man to love you the way that you need to be loved, and start just valuing you as you are. You're yeah. enough. Yeah. And value where you're at in your life. The stages change. And I'm at the point in my life where I'm 46. I have two of my children that will be out of the house next year. One leaves this year, one leaves next. And you look back and you're like, yeah, I'm not this, I'm not where your wife is. Yeah. And and I was comparing myself against women that were where I'm at now. 
And, and it's really, that is just such a battle and it, it goes nowhere good. Yeah, for sure. So I think there's also a, one of these ideas that I talk a lot about is uh, there's an identity crisis, Mm -hmm. which the crisis is this, the crisis is that people actually don't know who they are. Totally. Right. And, and a lot of that has stemmed through social media. I did a, I did a story post recently that was very controversial, which said, what did the word say? Social media sucks. Changed my mind. Right. <laughs> People are like, uh, what, well, what about you? You do social media and right. you, and I got a lot of lashback for this, but I stand behind what I said, right. Which is, I think it does exponentially more harm to people than it does good. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of the comments back were, well, it's garbage in garbage out, right? Like you choose who you follow and what you for want to engage sure. with and who you want to talk and to. And the algorithm and, will start sh- showing up and yeah. giving you what you look for, for sure. So I think it's, I think that's true to an extent, but I think I'm pretty disciplined with who I choose to follow and engage with, but still somehow garbage is always there and Mm -hmm. you can get into these cycles of spending an hour straight just scrolling and you get done and you just, the life has been sucked out of you and and it's not a good place to be. So I fully agree with that. Um, On the flip side, you know, and, and I think we're, we're, so we're launching a brand right now. We have a name for it, but I think the name is going to change hmm. because, and they don't know this yet. Um, my, my, my partners who are producing this podcast, because I think that the name actually needs to be, um, like a new name for social media, which might be like social goodness, or it could be mm-hmm. goodness media, or it could be hope media or something like this, which is the idea that we will only support clients in here that want to change the world and that want to help people and change people's lives and, and provide support and provide hope and these sort of things, because there's just, I have a zero tolerance policy for anything else. Right. Let's close with this. Okay. You mentioned that you use the word paralyzed earlier. You said there are people who feel literally paralyzed, Mm -hmm. right? In their current emotional state. Mm -hmm. What final just words of hope, support, advice do you have for, let's say specifically women who feel paralyzed? I would probably say first and foremost, there's always healing always there's always there's an abundance of it in this world and there's so much available to us now than ever before um if anyone is in that state where they're lost they're they're confused they're down they're paralyzed i would say shift your mindset from a um from a trauma um victim mentality to a, I got this and I can do differently mentality and go search out the resources. I will, I have actually a list I typed up of resources that's ridiculous. And I will hand it to anybody who asks of different modalities, um, different things you can do. There's, I mean, it's amazing. There's herbs, there's supplements. Did you know that there's actual herbs or, or uh, mixtures called flower essences that you drop them under the tongue and they literally can help change the state of your mind. And I've learned and mastered that. And so even today, I actually took one before I came. I cannot tell you the difference. It calmed me. Yeah. And there's so many tools out there. And what's really cool is, you, is as you search out these tools and as you start to work with, with people, you got to be careful now about, about who you work with. Because like we said, you know, not everybody it's always going to have the best intentions, but there's a lot of good facilitators out there and a lot of great methods of healing. But as you do that, you're educating yourself, you're empowering yourself and you're learning. I mean, I've done everything from parenting courses uh, to uh, classes on finances. I mean, I have made it my life mission to become better. And as you do that, you become, and anybody, you could do it from your bed. I mean, there is, there's so much available. Like, like you were saying, there's a lot of good out on social media as well. And if you find those right people, they will throw out tools constantly. And then I would say, slow down, find time to meditate, to journal, 
to pray mm. and do your yoga, deep breath work, do that, and then trust your intuition as you take those tools in to determine which ones feel correct and then do it and act upon it. And just like we talked about, as you do that, God will continue to give you those answers and the stepping stones will be easier to find and they're going to be, they're going to come quicker. So it's going to be hard at the beginning, but as you do it, you become, you start to master it and you become better. So there's hope there, there is a journey and that's what it's all about. It's a journey and it's really cool. It makes you, you really sit back and you're like, wow, I did that. Like, wow, I like (laughs) who I am. And that is, that is very, very, that is the blessing. That is the flip side of it. It's the polarity of the, of the sadness and the trials. It's the joy and the happiness. Does it mean that I'm trial free? Nope. I still have my trials. I still have my, my things, but what's cool is I have my tools. And so I, I much, much more easily and quickly find the answers to all aspects of my life. Yeah. Beautifully said. Ashley, thank you for joining the roller coaster. Thanks for having me. That was awesome.